All right, we've made it. Last lecture video, framework one. I hope everything has gone well so far for you guys. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump into this last video. Okay, as you can see here, it's talking about biodiversity conservation. Um, it's fitting that we talk about that today since we talked about biodiversity loss in the last lecture. Okay, so as you can see here, this first one is called in situ. Okay, it's kind of a crazy word, but all it means is it's conservation of species in their natural habitat. So you're not taking them out. Okay, you're leaving them where they naturally exist. Okay, so uh, national parks, nature reserves, those are you know ones that I think most of us are all familiar with. Okay, so how do they come up with a national park, uh, a nature reserve? Uh, reserve? How do they decide which place should be, which place shouldn't be? They just kind of have a rundown there. It talks about first the area that is suitable for the creation of the reserve has to be identified and delimited, okay? Boundaries determined, that's what it means, okay? So first of all, you have to decide what area would be um, worthy of creating a national park or nature reserve. Um, the next thing it talks about what happens with the property, okay, may have to be expropriated, meaning sometimes you have to um, go through some legal processes of taking the land from somebody. Um, you have to have legal framework, may need to be set up to control human activity, so if you think about like hunting, fishing, things like that, it has to be regulated, uh, national parks and nature reserves. Um, policing, okay, sometimes you might have to have park rangers, police. Um, if part of the area has been degraded due to bad land use, may need uh, rest, uh, restoring. So, you know, it says large financial costs. A lot of this stuff to, to set up and maintain national parks um, costs money. Okay? You're not going to get a bunch of people that are just volunteers um, keeping the place safe and, and well kept. So you got to play, you got to pay some money to keep, keep these things running and to establish them. And it talks about invasive species, which we, we learned about. Okay? It says they may have penetrated the area. You have to spend some money again to eliminate them. And then constant management. Okay, so there's a lot that goes into it, but this is the preferred method. This is what's best for the species that you're trying to conserve, leaving them in their natural habitat, um, which they have evolved um, to do to do well, to do best in. Okay. Um, so that is in C2. Okay, this next one here. Okay, we're going to talk about the advantages. Okay, so what are the advantages? I kind of talked about one. Um, the species will have all the resources that it is adapted to. Okay, so you don't really have to, you know, like in a zoo, for example, you know, create these artificial things um, in their environment to try to simulate their natural habitat. Um, the species will continue to evolve in their environment. Okay, so again, if you take them out of a zoo or take them out of this place and you put them in a zoo, you you stop that that um, adaptation, that, uh, that, that process of evolution that takes place. Um, the species have more space, again, okay, not much space in a, in a zoo. Bigger breeding populations, lots of different mates to choose from. It is cheaper to keep an organism in its natural habitat. Even though we talked about in the, the slide prior, the money it takes to set up the, the parks and to maintain them and to pay rangers and police and all that stuff, it's still cheaper to keep them in their own habitat. Um, the disadvantage, okay, it's difficult to control illegal exploitation, poaching. Okay, poaching is a big problem, uh, as you can see here. Okay, this is from Africa. Um, Africa has problems with people going in and trying to um, poach, you know, as you see here, tusks from elephants, uh, horns from rhinos, uh, because they're worth a lot of money. And when you have huge areas, large, vast areas of land, they're hard to um, always keep them under um, surveillance, okay? Have someone with eyes on every square inch of the area at all times. So there's always that particular aspect, that disadvantage. Um, the last one says the environment may need restoring, okay? Um, and, and invasive species are difficult to control. So that's a big one there. The disadvantage is, again, you have vast, large areas to go through and remove invasive species you know, it's one of those things where you have to kind of assess, can that be done? Should we, is it worth the, the time and the money to try to restore that particular natural habitat versus um, not doing it? Because sometimes it just may be financially um, impossible or physically impossible when you have 
too many factors stacked against, um, uh, you know, say Game and Fish, for example, or National Forest Service, these people that have to establish these parks. Sometimes the, the disadvantages just outweigh the advantages of, of creating nature reserves or national parks. Okay, so those are the advantages and disadvantages. As you can see, a lot more advantages than disadvantages. Uh, the next type is XC2. Okay, so think of X and exiting. This is where you take species out of their natural habitat and you put them in isolation. Okay, so again, zoos, captive breeding, that is the classic example. So captive breeding of endangered species is the last resort. Okay, so moving them to a zoo is the last thing you want to do. Okay, um, these species will have already reached the point where their populations would not recover in the wild. Okay, so when you take organisms, and this isn't every organism that's in a zoo. Okay, we know that there's certain things in a zoo that aren't uh, threatened or endangered. They're just there for our enjoyment. Uh, but if you're talking about conservation of an endangered species, okay, uh, one that is taken to a zoo most often and taken out of their natural habitat, um, it's because their populations just don't have the ability to uh, recover naturally. Okay, so again, it's the last resort, but sometimes the circumstances are so ex extenuating that they don't really have a choice. So the advantages and disadvantages, so again, you can see it flip-flops here. Um, it should make sense if in C2 is the preferred and XC2 is, uh, uh, is not the preferred method, that there should be more disadvantages. So the advantage, organisms are safe from poachers. Okay? Poachers can't get into the zoo and get them. Ensures good chance of survival for, for offspring because it's, you know, once the, the um, offspring are born, there's a lot of attention that is given to them to help them um, um, survive. Okay? Artificial insemination. Okay, so if you can't get two organisms to breed naturally, you can artificially inseminate them. Um, cross fostering. Sometimes you can get other species to parent or raise another species. Okay, so the disadvantages, this is a huge one, this first one, small gene pool. Okay, you're going to lose that biodiversity or that genetic diversity found within that species because there's less and less. Um, organisms to actually breed. So what you get really is you, you know, can get inbreeding as it says there in number two because you just don't have that many organisms. Um, your genetic diversity is, is very, very um, small. You can, you know, the term shallow gene pool um, that begins to, to occur in these situations. Um, organisms not born in the wild may not be able to survive reintroduction. So some people think, oh, just put them in a zoo for a while and raise them and then, you know, throw them back out in the wild. It's not always that way, okay? Um, some species can't do that. A lot of them, if they were just thrown back into the wild and reintroduced, uh, they may not successfully do so. Uh, very few are actually returned to the wild, so most that are born in the zoo stay in the zoo. Isolated in capti captivity, they do not evolve. Okay, so I talked about that. The evolutionary process really comes to a halt once organisms are moved to a zoo. Um, Number six, even if it's uh, possible to restore population in captivity, the natural habitat may have disappeared. So if we talk about habitat loss, okay, and loss of biodiversity, a lot of times, you know, obviously those go together. So if you have endangered species, one of the big reasons they're endangered is because their habitat is gone. So even though you may be able to um, get some of the last remaining organisms, there may be nowhere to release them to, okay? Um, and seven there, it talks about species that rely on this much help. They are often considered to be the living dead. It sounds kind of um, creepy, but the reason they term that phrase is because, you know, in all actuality, they're, you know, living on borrowed time. Most of these species, um, if they can't be returned to the wild, and there's only a few of them left, oh, sorry guys, um, they're not going to make it very long. Okay, so they term them the living dead. All right, so, you know, seems kind of sad, but uh, that, can, that can become the case when biodiversity in a certain species becomes too low. Uh, there's not, not a whole lot of good outcomes left. All right, so um, those are the advantages, disadvantages, and, and the types, XC2 and NC2. Um, this, third, this third type is called biodiversity hotspot, okay? 
this is an area that supports an especially high number of species that are endemic. Okay, so um, make sure you understand what endemic means. Endemic means that they're species that are found nowhere else in the world. So when you talk about these hot spots, which you can see down here in red, what makes them so um, important to preserve is because if that species is lost, okay, in that particular hot spot or that particular um, area, it's gone forever, okay. Um, so it's very, very important. That's why they call them hot spots. Okay, they're very critical. So the hotspot approach, as it says there, is a whole ecosystem approach that focuses attention on areas where the greatest number of species can pr be protected with the least space or effort. So you're going for real dense areas, okay, where you have a whole bunch of organisms in the smallest amount of space. Okay, so what do you know? What are uh, most biodiversities have in common? It talks about here at least 1,500 plant species found nowhere else in the world. Um, already 70% of their habitat has been lost, so you're talking about they're in, it's in critical danger of being lost entirely. And at the same time, even though as you can see here, there's 30% left, there still is 1,500 plant species found nowhere else in the world. So again, it's very, very dense and rich in, in biodiversity. Um, and the last one, the 34 biodiversity hotspots are home to nearly half of all planets, or planets, sorry, plant and vertebrate species. Okay, so you're talking again, very, very dense populations of biodiversity. Hence, they are hotspots or very, very important. Okay. Um, seed banks. Okay, now we're not really talking so much about um, living organisms so much as, uh, you know, as the possibility of um, bringing back or restoring biodiversity that may be lost. Okay, so seed banks are put together, constructed to um, keep, kind of, kind of store or, as it says, bank that, that biodiversity so that if it's lost in the wild, um, we have it. Okay, so it talks about what it does. Seeds can be maintained for decades or centuries. Um, duplicate stocks can be maintained. Uh, must be maintained in conditions with less than 5% humidity. So one of the things with these seed banks, um, as you can see the lady dressed there, um, they're usually in very, very cold um, areas with very little humidity. So it's not like, you know, you can just set up one of these in, in a basement of somebody's house. Okay, it has to be special conditions. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's, that's um, kind of a disadvantage is not every species can be done this way. Okay? Not every single seed on planet Earth can be stored this way efficiently. Um, seeds need to be regularly germinated to renew stock or seeds will eventually uh, lose their viability, meaning you have to, as it says there, germinate them and let them um, renew themselves. You can't again keep the seed forever for eternity and then you know 200 years later just plant it in the ground and it comes up and it's fine. Okay? Um, doesn't always work that way. Um, seed banks are at risk from power failure. Okay, so again, uh, natural disaster, war. Okay, so obviously some extreme things. But if you don't have power to these facilities and maintain that um, ideal conditions that they need, um, you can compromise these seeds. And seeds kept in seed banks do not evolve. So again, you know, just like animals taken out of the wild, when seeds are put in these seed banks, it's sort of like you know, you take them out at a certain period and then, you know, try to reintroduce them a thousand years later or whatever it is, um, they may not be best suited for the new environment. So again, just like the uh, animal species, plant species also, when you take them out of the wild, you disrupt that evolutionary process. All right, so we've talked so, uh, so far about in situ, ex situ, biodiversity hotspots, seed banks. Okay, so those are the four primary methods of biodiversity conservation. Okay? What we're going to talk about next is what type of legislation. So what is the, the U.S. government doing? Okay, so you have the Endangered Species Act, and it talks about level of government and regulatory agency, uh, when it was enacted, why it was enacted, description of regulation. Uh, so you know what you need to understand primarily for level of government and regulatory agency. Okay? So it's federal. All of these uh, acts of, um, are created by Congress. Okay? Um, they're on the federal level. You can see here U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Those are the regulatory agencies 
um, that make sure everyone is uh, following these um, these acts and the the um, regulatory policies that have been put in place. When it was acted, 1973, and why was it enacted? You know, it says Endangered Species Act, so it should make sense that it is to prevent the further elimination of animal species in the U.S. Okay, so what does it allow Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA? What does it allow them and the government to do? Okay, so endangered species, threatened species, critical habitat. Okay, they came up with those terms. Okay, or they didn't come up with those terms, but what it did was it it forbid governments and citizens from harming the listed species and habitats. Okay, so if you have critical habitat, threatened or endangered species, which we learned about, it forbids governments and citizens, okay, so us, you, and government officials from harming those particular organisms or their habitat. Uh, it forbids trade in products made from listed species. So if it's endangered or, or threatened, um, you cannot um, trade in those products. Okay, forbids trade in products made from listed species. Okay, so if it's you know some sort of an animal that you want to make fur out of, okay, a fur coat or a uh, uh, fur hat or something, you can't do that. Okay, it's against the law. And it requires U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to maintain official list of endangered and threatened species. Okay, so these lists of endangered and threatened are constantly monitored and updated. All right, so the Endangered Species Act really what it boils down to gave the federal government the power to. Um, you know, create and maintain lists of what is endangered, what is threatened, protect their habitat, okay, again, um, distinguishing what is critical, and then protecting them, not allowing people to um, harm them and not allow people to uh, profit off of them. Okay, so that's what the Endangered Species Act did. And the last one we have here is CDs, okay, this is international, not here in the U.S., um, or not just here in the U.S., this is, this is you know, many countries. But what it's called the conven convention, geez, I can't talk, sorry guys, the Convention in International Trade in Endangered Species. So 1988 um, is when it was established, and what they were trying to do is encourage the sustainable exploitation. So really to minimize um, how much these organism are, organisms are exploited in sustainable meaning, make sure that you know the way you're using them now does not inhibit their uh, the, the possibility of them uh, being around 100, 200, 300 years from now for future generations. All right, so uh, the CDS conference determined the status of a species and whether or not its um, exploitation requires regulation. Okay, so it says species are placed into different appendices, appendices. Okay, depending on their status. So appendix one, total banned. Okay, on exploitation meaning nothing can be, they cannot be exploited at all, okay? Um, appendix two would be limited exploitation subject to quotas, and three would be species recurring, uh, requiring protection in certain states only. So as you can see, three, two, and one, okay, it's obviously like number one is total, okay, total ban, no exploitation, no selling, no trading, nothing like that, and then they get a little bit looser as far as the, the regulations on two and three, um, but again, all of those species, regardless of the, the appendices which they are, are classified in, are going to get some sort of regulation and monitoring on them. And the last one, species are reassessed every two years to see where they fall in that scale. All right, so um, again, what we talked about today is how biodiversity is conserved. Okay, so in situ, leaving it in their natural habitat, ex situ, taking them out, so like a zoo. Uh, we talked about biodiversity hotspots, which are small areas, dense areas with lots of uh, biodiversity, um, seed banks, and then we talked about the um, Endangered Species Act, and right here, CDs. Okay, so you guys have a quiz that you'll take on this, and then you need to study for your test. If you have any questions, um, let me know. Um, if not, good luck on the test, and you will hear from me on the next framework. All right.